try to educate you further about things that you may or may not know. But when I always talk about what my favorite subject is, it happens to be the tectonic relationship of the Hillby chloride shift to the adjacent rock units in Claiborne County, Alabama. No, no, now, I hope you all are excited about that topic, and if not, I do have a backup. <laughs> <laughs> many, many years ago, I was elected president of the Davis Family Association in Woodville, Mississippi at Rosemont Plantation. And on that day, I didn't really understand what the change in my life would be, but what became kind of a, a wish became a dream and that it gave me access to travel around and learn about my great-great-grandfather. I'd lived 27 years at that point in time and knew about three things about him. That he lived, that he was my great-great-grandfather, and he was president of the Confederate States of America. As I go forward in these days, and every day I see new people at, at, at uh, Beauvoir, I find out that most people have that same knowledge or less. They don't even know he was alive until February of 1861. Tuesday night we had a cemetery tour. I don't know if any of you attended it, but we had 600 people there. And I spoke to every one of them in these groups. And what I found out, the first thing is, they don't know anything about Jefferson Davis and half of them. They've never been to Bowl or more than that. So we have a challenge in front of us. Fifteen months ago, Carol and I came to the coast, and we reflected on everything that we've done to get here. We've been traveling for 35 years across the country, everywhere that Davis has been. So when I speak about Jefferson Davis, I'm not speaking from reading it in a book or somebody telling me about it or go to the History Channel or go to Wikipedia. I can actually say that when I talk about Fairview, Kentucky, where he was born in 1808, I've stood there. If you talk about the bed that he died in in New Orleans, I can say, touched it. If you talk about the grave in Hollywood Cemetery or Memory Cemetery, said, I can be there. But it goes further than that. And what we've understood about Jefferson Davis is one thing in particular. The American public believes that he was incarnated in February of 1861 just dropped on the face of the earth, became president of the Confederate States of America, and also created the institution of slavery and the Confederate States of America. And if you don't believe me, we've had Yankees down, and they don't even think anything other than that, and they think he probably died the next day because they don't know anything further than that piece of information. Now, down the street, about, what, four miles, is the Jefferson Davis Presidential Library. I don't know how many of you have seen that building. That building is 24,500 square feet. You remember that there was a presidential library that was there before. Katrina came through our hurricane-proof building that we didn't move any of the exhibits on and destroyed all the Davis artifacts that were in the bottom floor. So we don't have any Davis artifacts left. So when Carol and I had the opportunity to come down to Beauvoir and assume this position, we knew what we were up against. First of all, we were up against a tremendous void in the understanding of Jefferson Davis and, and what he did. And the second thing that we're up against is we don't have anything to portray Jefferson Davis. Now, most people will look at that and say, man, that's, that's horrible. That's, that's, that's bad. But actually, it's not. What it is is it's an opportunity. So let's talk about some of the opportunities that we've seen as we travel around the United States we have tried to understand what it is that's available to us and how it is that we want Jefferson Davis to be looked at as we go forward. The significance of Jefferson Davis doesn't really start until probably 1824 when he enrolls at West Point in reference to his, his oldest son, his oldest brother, Joseph, making that possible. Davis really at that point in time is the youngest of nine children and they moved from Fairview, Kentucky to Rosemont Plantation, and he was on that plantation for most of his life until 1824. So look at him at 1808 to 1824. Do the math. He's pretty young when he goes to West Point. Before that time, though, he'd actually had three educational opportunities, two of them in Kentucky. One was at a private Catholic high school. The other one was at Transylvania University, I think it's called, or Transylvania College. A university, I can't remember. 
By the way, one of the things that we find out about Jefferson Davis as we go forward is political correctness is run amok. So if you go to Transylvania, by which my grandfather gave them a large collection of Jefferson Davis papers, and you mention Jefferson Davis, they go, who? Which is a shame because they've got one of the largest collections of Jefferson Davis papers in the country. Not only that, about a year and a half ago, Linda Christ calls me, who's the letter of the papers of Jefferson Davis, and she says, have you seen this, this document on eBay? And I said, no, I haven't. She said, that's from Transylvania. Somebody needs to tell them somebody's taking their papers out of the collection and putting them on eBay. People are walking out. They don't even think enough of those collections to hold them in, in security. So again, we're not faced only with that dilemma in reference to the one date in history, but we're also faced with what else is going on in Jefferson Davis. In 1824, he goes to West Point in 1828. Somehow or another, through an act of God and a lot of personal perseverance, he does graduate. Now, he had a really fun time at West Point. And you say, how is that possible? Well, remember, it was really small back then. And there was a little tavern down the road not far called Benny Hill. Tavern, or Pen Benny's Tavern, not Benny Hill, but Benny's Tavern. <laughs> and all of the cadets would go down there because, you know, if, if, I don't know if anybody's been to upstate New York, but West Point is probably the darkest, grayest, coldest place I've ever been in my life. And I've been there at Thanksgiving and Christmas, and that was really terrible. I can't even imagine what it was like in January. So they would go down the road. And it was illegal to do that, but they got there anyway, somehow or another. And Davis gets caught. They get the whole group caught, and they take him to court-martial him. And at his court-martial, Davis decides, out of his own ignorance or intelligence, whichever is to defend himself. And so when his turn comes, he's asked to defend himself. And he gets up in front of this court-martial board, and he says, I defy you to find someone that witnessed me taking a drink at Benny's Tavern. If you can find that person, please bring him and, and have evidence, or else I say I never did. So the court goes and asks everybody in the courtroom, of course all the cadets are there, and they say, well, no, we never did see him take a drink at Benny's Tavern. <laughs> well, why didn't they see him take a drink at Benny's Tavern? It wasn't that he didn't have a drink, it's that when he had a drink, he turned his back. And nobody ever saw him take a drink. So his defense worked and he was let go. That Christmas, however, there was another incident that came along, and they had eggnog, and they were making big batches of eggnog, and for some reason, Davis was in the hallway, and someone came to him and said, they're going to come, go to your room. And he went to his room. About 10 minutes later, they busted that party, and something like 20 cadets were kicked out. And so Davis were kind of blessed in a lot of ways. Again, his intelligence and his ignorance worked, but God was in his way to, to put him out of harm's way for him to get through. 1824, he goes to the Black Hawk Wars. Nobody knows about the Black Hawk Wars. I don't even think they're in the history books anymore, but there was a big uprising. I mean, Black Hawk was, was terrorizing the northeast part of our country, or northwest part of the country at that time, Wisconsin and that area. So Davis goes there, and fortuitously, he would be under Zachary Taylor. Now, Zachary Taylor's a colonel. He has two or three daughters. Davis, unfortunately or fortunately for us, falls in love with Sarah Knox Taylor, and he falls in love with her. And he's up there, and, and Zachary Taylor does not want this marriage to happen. So he tells Davis that he will not be trothered. can't marry my daughter. And so Sarah and Jefferson actually at this point in time decide they need to test their love. Now, this is really highly encouraging to me about what some young people probably ought to do, but they separated for a year geographically. He was, didn't see her for one year. At the end of that year, he went back and they were as love, in love as they were, if not more, and chose to get married. So he resigns from the Army in 1835. They go to Lexington, Kentucky. They get married in his mother-in-law or Sarah Knox's mother-in-law's aunt's house in Lexington, Kentucky. Still no Zachary in the picture. I mean, he's not, he's not with this, this union at all. Davis takes Sarah Knox Taylor down to meet his nine brothers and sisters all over Mississippi and ends up in St. Francisville. And unfortunately, they both contract yellow fever. Sarah Knox Taylor dies. This is three months after their wedding. And so Davis is dying 
he's actually thinking that she's singing to her to him days after she's already died because he's as sick as she is. When he finds out about this, he goes into somewhat of a depression and seclusion, and he elects to go back towards his oldest brother, Joseph, who owns Hurricane Plantation south of Vicksburg at Davis Bend on the Mississippi River, some of the most fertile land in the country. Joseph gives him about 74 acres, 7,400 acres, and says, here it is, you make your own plantation. So he did, it was called Briarfield because of the briars. Davis works at this for eight years. He works on the plantation, he reads every night, and he becomes very educated because Joseph is an educated lawyer, very powerful person in Mississippi. Matter of fact, there's a book on him if you ever want to hear about him. And behind the scenes, he was making a great difference in Mississippi. Davis, during that period of time, doesn't do anything at all but study and work. And finally, his, his brother kind of pushes him out the door and says, hey, you need to kind of go out and you know try to see the rest of the world. And so he goes to a soiree. And this soiree, he runs on to a lady by the name of Marina Howe. Now, if you take a picture of Marina Howe and Sarah Knox Taylor and put them side by side, the comparison is remarkable. They're both very petite, they're black hair, and very, very vivacious. And then Marina Howe was, was really something. Marina Howe's grandfather was governor of New Jersey for two or three terms, very famous family from New Jersey. Anyway, they spark a conversation. Conversation leads to matrimony. and. And it's interesting, we were just reading letters, and in this period of, of, of matrimony or, or, or dating, they're about to get married, and then all of a sudden we read this letter, and something happens. I mean, these letters before are yours lovingly and truly and whatever, and then all of a sudden one of these letters pops up, and it says, your friend Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, Verena's response is, Verena, there's no anything. So there is a period of this that, that there's something that came up, but something unresolved, but it happened very quickly, and then it unresolved itself, and they get married, and they move back to Briarfield. Davis, at this point in time, decides that maybe politics is something he wants to engage in, so he starts to make political speeches. His first speech is on the, the uh, porch of the... Uh, old Courthouse Museum in Vicksburg, Mississippi. That leads to him running for office. He runs for legislature in 1846 and gets elected. Now, who else is elected in 1846 but one of our dearest compatriots, Abraham Lincoln. So Lincoln and Davis are in the House of Representatives at the same time. We went to the archives in, in Washington, D.C., and we asked the question, is there any realm of these two people. Now, they must have seen one another. There's no question about that. They were in the same chambers, but there's nothing that has both of their signatures. So, And they were really at um, opposite ends of the spectrum. Because what happens in 1846 is there's a little conflict going on in Texas, in Mexico, called the War of 1847. has already started. And Davis, you know, with his military background, what's he like to do? He likes to go to war. He likes to fight. And he's a proponent of it. Lincoln, on the other hand, is saying, no, we don't need that, we don't want that. Well, Davis has got manifest destiny. He can see that the country's going to be one side to the other. Lincoln can't see that. Lincoln's against it. Davis is for it. Davis quits. The legislature comes to Mississippi, creates the Mississippi Rifles, or joins them and takes them on to Texas. Lincoln runs for re-election and he loses because of that issue. It's an amazing thing how that changed the dynamics of Lincoln and Davis. Davis goes to the War of 1847. Well, before that period of time, though, another interesting thing had happened. When Davis was going to marry Verena, he gets on a riverboat in, Rick in Vicksburg going to, to Natchez. And who's on the boat? I haven't seen this guy in eight years. Zachary Taylor. So as the story goes, they walk around the boat numerous times. And finally, at the end of this story, they're at the railing and so the story goes as Zachary puts his arm around Jefferson Davis. Now, we don't know what was said, but you can just imagine. You know, all of our pains we've shared, and we've reconciled, and I forgive you, and let's go on down the road, and, and whatever. That's a blessing. God put them in that boat at that time for a reason, and we didn't know what that reason was. But they go to war in 1847. Of course, Zachary Taylor's really, really popular. After that war in 1848, what happens to him? He's like the president, old rough and ready, because he's a war hero, and America loves war heroes. 
you don't believe me, look at the history. Look at Grant, look at Eisenhower. Same type of thing that we're going. Andrew Jackson, same, same thing going on here. So Davis goes back to Washington, and he spends more time in the White House with Zachary Taylor than anybody, probably. I mean, he's, he's there, Green is there, they're, they're right in the midst of everything that's going on. Unfortunately, Zachary Taylor only lasts about 16 months in office, and Davis is at his deathbed when he, when he passes away. So Davis goes through that period of time. He's a senator by then. He doesn't go run a re-election. He actually resigns. He comes back to Mississippi. He runs against Foote for governor. Didn't win. So he's back at Briarfield. In 1852, a gentleman by the name of Franklin Pierce gets elected president of the United States of America. What America probably doesn't know, and we didn't know until about three years ago, is that Franklin Pierce and his wife and his son, after he was elected, were on the railway going on a trip and the rail, the, the train derailed. And Zachary Taylor's son was impaled right in front of him. And that destroyed his wife. I mean, she went in severe depression. Zachary Taylor recognizes that he's not prepared to be president. He's just, I mean, he's dealing with this. I can't even imagine. No parents are not meant to marry their children. So he's looking for someone who's got strength and integrity and the knowledge to be Secretary of War, and who does he choose? Jefferson Davis. Now everybody says, okay, big deal. During the next four years, the improvement of this country that people don't know about are amazing. And this is my elevator speech. I start with West Point and say, name three presidents that went to West Point, and people are going, well, Davis is one, and oh yeah, and Grant and Eisenhower. So it stirs their imagination. Hey, I didn't know that about this guy. What else do I not know? Well, a couple of things happened while he was in the Secretary of War that are really important. When he got there, they were trying to design and engineer the new Capitol building. And they were struggling with this. They had three architectural funds and a bunch of engineering funds, and nothing was happening. Davis convinced the president to put that underneath his jurisdiction, and he'd take care of it. So they did. He came in, fired everybody, and hired Mings, hired the architect, and started to develop that engineering and design that you see at the United States Capitol today. If you go to the United States Capitol today and walk in, the first thing you see is 44 feet Statue of Freedom, the statue that's on top of the dome. About the fifth word in the description of that is Jefferson Davis. He was wholly 100% responsible, not only for saying there should be a statue on top of the dome, but approval of that design that's on top of the dome. If you read about the history of the Capitol, either you read Freedom's Cap or you read the, the history of the Capitol of the United States, you'll find that Davis is about 80% of the story. Nobody knows that. But if you go to the Capitol, you'll see that underneath in their visitor's deal. So it's an amazing part of history that people don't know. They don't really you know, put that together. <clears throat> the third fact I usually throw out, which is one of my favorites is that Jefferson Davis knew about Manifest Destiny. That's why he went to the War of 1847. That's why they wanted that southwestern part of the United States. But he recognized that it was going to be a full country. From the Mississippi River to the Pacific, you couldn't get there from here, right? You know, I mean, it was cattle, uh, cattle trains, and it was Conestoga wagons and horses. It took forever. But he thought that he were going to have a railway. So. Congress had appropriated the money for a survey of all the transcontinental railways. The money came to him. He, he appointed all of the survey parties for the four routes. They went out and surveyed all this. If you look at the history of the, of the railways, every one of those routes was approved by, guess who? Jefferson Davis. So when you see that great picture of Grant pounding in that golden state, that promontory point with the two locomotives towards one another, they just completed something that Jefferson Davis had done in the 1850s. We also talk about things that really make a difference. So what was Davis's feeling towards what was going on after Secretary War, he becomes a senator again. And he is recognizing that this whole scenario, this whole thing that we call the United States was in deep, deep trouble. He was not a proponent of separation, but he was a proponent of saying there has to be a solution to all these problems. And there wasn't a, 
there wasn't a solution. There just wasn't going to be a solution in the short term. So in 1861, when Mississippi seceded, Jefferson Davis followed Mississippi, and he came home to Briarfield, thinking that he was going to be a general. You know, he's got all this military training and whatever. And little did he know, on February the 8th or thereabouts, that a Sloan rider would show up with a telegram saying, you have been appointed. And although it probably said elected, but it's appointed. Remember that there's no election because there's no, there's no voting. It was appointed by the cabinet that was formed in the Confederate States of America as president of the Confederate States of America. Two phrases come to mind when we talk about that. Verena describes it as he turns ashen white because he doesn't want that responsibility, but he knows he's going to take the job. And the other one is the man and the hour had met. And we phrase that, and you see that in history. Davis serves that four years, and everybody thinks that's probably the height of his life. And it really wasn't, because we have already dismissed in the history books the 52 years that I just talked about, because it's not important anymore to the winners go, to the victors go, the spoils, so that Jefferson Davis is not important in anything that we did before that. A couple of things happened during the war that I wanted to point out that people don't know about. One is that Joseph, his son, was about four years old. Jefferson Jr. is about eight. The White House of the Confederacy has a, a large porch with a railing. And Jefferson Jr. used to get up on the railing and walk across it and jump back down. Joseph one day decides he's going to do the same thing. And he's not quite as strong, he's not quite as big, and falls. It's about eight feet. And he hits the concrete right beside the house with his head. Severe concussion, brain damage, hemorrhage. By the time Davis there, he's unconscious and dies in his arms. So here he is, just like Lincoln. Lincoln's losing his son, Davis loses his son. The beauty of it is about three months later, Winnie, Verena Ann Davis is born, which saves Verena and Davis a lot of heartache that Mary Todd and Abraham went through because they didn't have any more kids. And so there was a blessing in something in reference to Verena Ann's birth, but Joseph's death was still devastating in that fact. One other thing that happens in Richmond is in 1863, Jefferson's going from his office to the White House, and there's an orphan African-American child on the street. His name is Jim Lindbergh. And Davis picks him up, takes him home, and says, where do you live? Who are you? And he's an orphan. Jefferson Davis adopts Jim Lindbergh as one of his sons. He's in his house throughout the end of the war. Now, as you all know, Davis left Richmond. The day that he left Richmond was a Sunday. And Jefferson Davis was in church at St. Paul's at 11 o'clock. Carol and I were in St. Paul's a month ago on a Sunday at 11 o'clock in Jefferson Davis's pew, trying to feel that. What was it that he was feeling? And we've been there before, but as we now have absorbed this presidential library, I want to make sure that I understand when I say what he felt, what was he feeling? And what we know is that he was feeling near to God that God was more important in his life right then than leaving Richmond or the war or the family or anything else. How do I know that? Because it took two telegrams to get him out of that church. And even then he left reluctant. He leaves Richmond, they go to Danville, they transfer down to Carolina. Meanwhile, of course, Lee and Grant are working out their, their convenience at Appomattox. Davis gets to Irwinville, Georgia. His family has been reunited with him, and he's captured. Now imagine this. Imagine that you're Maggie, Margaret, at nine years old, and you're in a tent. Jefferson Jr. is about seven years old. Uh, Winnie's there, and I think Samuel's. And their father gets out of the tent. Marina's there. Here's a horseman with a rifle, jumps off. And he's pointing at Jefferson Davis saying, we're going to capture you. You're it. And Davis is kind of going, I'm going to shoot this guy and we're going to get away. And the only thing that saves Davis's life is Verena. Verena gets in between them and says, you know, either one of you shoots, you've got to shoot through me. 
And otherwise, Davis probably would have taken a shot, and it would have been over because they probably would have shot him there too. But they didn't. They capture him. They capture part of his cabinet. They capture a guy named Frank Lubbock, who would be later a governor of Texas. <coughs> They take Davis to Fortress Monroe and put him in a casemate. Now, I don't know if you all know what a casemate is, but it's where the powder's held for the cannons. And a casemate of Fortress Monroe is about yay high above the, the, the water the Chesapeake Bay. It's the coldest, darkest, dampest place that you ever want to be. That's his jail cell. And for the next two years, the light would be on 24 hours a day. The guards would walk 24 hours a day, and Davis was the only person in that cell for the first day, he was in chains. He wasn't allowed visitors for about the first year, finally, but when he gets to see him, he has two books. The one book that he uses constantly is the Bible. That's still there. It's been returned to that museum, and it's there. Davis finally is released in 1868. He has had a hearing, and people like Vanderbilt, and Greeley, and abolitionists Signed the bond, he's released, he goes to Canada where his family has been moved to. He picks him up, he goes back and forth to England a couple of times, comes back, he's trying to find where he's going to be. He doesn't really have a, a job, doesn't have a career. He ends up in Memphis, Tennessee in 1870. Fortuitously to us, to me, Margaret falls in love in Memphis, Tennessee, and marries Joel Addison Hayes in 1876. Matter of fact, they got married on New Year's Day. I know. That's an interesting fact. I don't know why you picked that day, but if they hadn't have met in Memphis, you wouldn't be listening to me bore you to death at 6.30 <laughs> in the afternoon. But anyway, they marry. Jefferson Davis is there. Jefferson Davis Jr. is there. He had gone to BMI, which was his hope that he was going to be a successful student, and he had his, his father's genes. I think that runs in the family. And a little bit rambunctious, and he got thrown out of BMI. And he was going to go back and get the Alpha free run, and he dies too. So at this point in the time, in 1876, Jefferson Davis has no male heirs. He's only got one daughter that got married, and she marries a guy named Joel Addison Hayes in Memphis, Tennessee. It's an important fact that will change a lot of things here as we go forward. In 1877, Jefferson Davis comes back to Mississippi. Now, I didn't know a couple of things, but Jim Miller and I have had this conversation. I also talked to the, to the, to the folks at St. Mark's. Jefferson Davis went to both churches on the coast when he came back. But prior to that point in time, a couple of things happened. He was here in the 1840s, and he actually bought property, according to some of the documents that I'm reading. He actually owned land in Mississippi City, I think. I'm not sure. But he met a guy named Teacock. <laughs> and they had a conversation. And there was a church, probably on Teach Garden Road, or thereabouts. And it was a Baptist church, I believe, or a Baptist. And it had burned down. And there was no church. And that's where the Episcopal Church was meeting at the same time. So according to folks that I've talked to, is that the belief is, and I can't say that it's factual, but I, I want to say it's factual, is that what I heard was that T. Garden and Jefferson Davis got together and he said to T. Garden, you give them the land and I'll give them the money to buy, build the church. And so if you look at St. Mark's today and where it was before the storm, that was the land that was built by Davis to build the Episcopal Church of St. Mark's. So they say. And I want to believe that, so I'm going to say it was true. <laughs> Maybe you all can help me with those facts. It's, it's pretty important to us, though, because when Davis gets here, he's at both churches and, and it's on the vestry. So he comes down here in 1877. He lives at Bulba at the library cottage, Sarah Dorsey rents, rents in that room. Of course, Marine is kind of up in arms. She didn't come for a while. She wasn't too happy about that relationship. But finally, in 1878, she comes down and they finish the rise and fall of Confederate government in 1880. It's published in 1881. As a matter of fact, we were just in Dallas last week, and a guy came in and popped the book down, and it was from his great-great-grandfather, and it was signed, first edition, received June 1881, mm -hmm. in his own signature, and that's one of the original books. Sarah Dorsey befriends Jefferson and says, I want you to buy Bulwark. And so they sign in an agreement before that, that Jefferson can pay the entire fee, 
She dies, Davis pays the estate, he owns Bull Wall, he would live there until 1889. What important things happened in that period of time that reflect what you were just talking about? Well, the courthouse is one of them. So that's a, that's a rebuilt structure, is that right? That's not the original courthouse. We have a film at Bull Walk talking about Bull Walk. And it starts out, and there's a, there's a uh, voiceover of Jefferson Davis, one of Jefferson Davis' speeches in, I think, 1880. When did the Liberty Bell come? 86, 84, 1880? Do you remember what year it was? Somewhere like that. But he was asked to speak. And he was on those courthouse book. And he started the speech saying, my fellow Americans. And then he had to stop. And he says, wait a minute, can't say that. Why couldn't he say that? He was still the only person left in the United States that didn't have United States citizenship after the war. It was never given to him. They asked him if he would have accept a pardon. And he says, I will not pardon myself for something that I don't have the wrong. And so he held to that throughout his life. So that was a, that historical marker is there, or in, it is there. So we have a connection to the building that you all are about to become, I hope, owners or leasers or whatever. So it's 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 so neat to be able to talk about Gulfport history and put both St. Mark's and that building in reference to where we are. So I'm going to give you a couple of little facts, and then I'll stop talking that you don't know. Davis dies in December of 1889 in New Orleans. He'd gone to Briarfield. Remember that his son-in-law moved to Carter Springs in 1885. Nobody's overseeing his plantation. He goes up there, catches cold, gets back here, dies in New Orleans in December 6, 1889. The whole Hayes family that was in Memphis had moved to Colorado Springs, Colorado. We think there's two reasons they did that. We think one of them is Joel Addison Hayes' health. But the other thing that we're discovering by an author that did a, a, a biography of Winnie is that the stress on Winnie that Margaret saw was immense. Because they were Davis descendants in the South, there was really no way for them to go. It was kind of, they're, they're Davises. And we're not sure, and I can't prove it, but I'm going to read a lot more. I'm not sure that, that Margaret might not have said, you know, we need to go somewhere. And this is a good time for us to go. Because the Hayes family moves to Colorado Springs, Colorado in 1885, and no more Davis descendants do you hear about in the South. Because Winnie's going to go with her mother to New York, and that pressure's off. So when I grew up, I don't have the pressure of being Jefferson Davis's descendant in Mississippi. I don't know what the difference would have been, but I can imagine. Can you imagine what Margaret must have felt like with the only offspring of the present. Anyway, they come back to New Orleans on the train. They get here probably, I don't know what day they get here, the 10th, 12th, whatever, and he's laying in state. <coughs> in that room in that day, Verena and Winnie Davis and all the Hayes are in the room. So there's Verena Hayes, there's Lucinda Hayes, there's Justin Hayes, there's William Hayes, there's Jill Hayes, there's Margaret Davis Hayes, and there's two Davises. And Dave, Verena walks over to the window and this is oral history coming from my great aunt, whose mother was Lucinda Hayes, who was in the room at the time. And I didn't know this until four years ago. She asked me how I got my name. I said, no, you don't now. <laughs> Marina walks over the window, points over across the street, and says, there lies the last Davis. Isn't it a shame we can't do something about that? So in that room during that period of time, one of these brilliant people, they all had to be brilliant because they're all relation to me, <laughs> decided that they'd look at my grandfather, whose name was Jefferson Addison Hayes, and ask him to change his name to Jefferson Hayes hyphen Davis. And he's, you know, he's brilliant. He's six years old. He, oh, sure, I could do that. That's his story. <clears throat> so they get back on the train after the burial. They go to Jackson, Mississippi, and by an act of legislature in February of 1890, which was a large document like this, they changed his name to Jefferson Hayes Hyphen Davis. So I'm standing here before you as a great great grandson with the last name Davis because of that instance in that room in that day. Otherwise, my name would be Bertram Hayes. Now everybody says, how many more descendants are there? There's 50 or 60 of my generation. We have lots of Mosers and Youngs and Sullivans and Grays and Sittons and all kinds. 
but fortuitously, I am the only one that carries the name. So we have Jefferson Hayes Davis, we have Addison Hayes Davis, my father, he was the only son of his generation. We have Jefferson Hayes Davis III, my brother who's passed away, and we have Bertram Hayes Davis, and now we have Joel Addison Hayes Davis and Sarah Taylor Hayes Davis. Sarah Taylor, ring any bells? First person in our family to be named after Sarah Taylor. Everybody else has been a balloon for all of these years. Hmm. We came here to correct history not to correct it so much as to educate and tell people about everything that I've just told you and more. We want people to understand what Jefferson Davis did. We don't want them to be hung on that one day in history because if they do that, they lose a lot of history that is not known. So how have we done that? We've been here for 15 months. I got here in July, Carol got here in March. First thing I knew was that there was this young lady by the name of Andy Oswald, who you all probably know, and she said, we're going to do Christmas at Volvo. And Carol looked at her and looked at me, and I said, this is July, we're not going to do that. <laughs> well, we did. I don't know how many of you came. Did anybody come to Christmas last year? Well, we hope there's no more of you come this year. We lit 100 oak trees. We brought Christmas back to 1889 in that historic quad in the building. So this year, we're lighting 150 oak trees. Not only that, we have got Verena's Garden that's just been finished and the Presidential Library that opened this summer. So again, what we've been able to, we're, we're blessed. We had nothing to do with any of that. That was all given to us when we walked onto the property. We knew where we would be today. Our challenge is going forward. How do we see our vision? How do we see the interactive environment to display all these things that I've talked about and all these things that people touched in reference to Davis? So that's what Carol and I are doing. We're traveling the country. We've been to Washington, D.C. twice. We've been to Texas twice. We're putting together the resources, and we're going to create the environment for the financial support necessary to make the Jefferson Davis Presidential Library as important as Lincoln or Carter or Bush or LBJ. And that's our, our goal, and that's what we see. We want Bolivar to be the Monticello of the South. And why can't it be? We've got a house, a library, a garden. We've got the cottages. We've got a bayou. We've got 52 acres. We've got everything that they do. What we don't have is recognizance of how great this guy was. So that's what we bring. And when we went to Washington, D.C., people moved their schedules around to see us. We saw everybody, the capital architect, the, the, the director of the archives, the Senate historian, C-SPAN, all of your senators, all your representatives noted people like Haley Barber and Trent Lott moved their schedules around to see us so that we could tell them what we're doing. And they all agreed that this is a project that they all want to be part of. So as we move forward, you're going to see a tremendous opportunity for people to participate on a national level. We want Bolivar to be back what it was and the presidential library to be just like any other presidential library in the United States. <coughs> Now, as Jim said, I brought props. <laughs> you like my prop? <laughs> These are the trees that we give to nonprofits and individuals that we auction off at the Festival of Trees on November the 6th, this year. 7th. I'm sorry, that's the night we kick off the Christmas event. And we brought them in case anybody wants them. They're free. We only ask you if you want to decorate them and bring them back to us on November the 3rd and we auction off and the proceeds go to help Bolivar. But we hope you'll come see Christmas at Bolivar. It is an 1889 experience. Jefferson reading in the house, crafts, <laughs> games, music, food, everything that you want to that period. This is not anything that is extravagant. It's an 1889 historical opportunity to, to enjoy Christmas and it's a wonderful time. We're blessed to be here. We believe God made us to be where we are, giving me the experience to know and all about Jefferson Davis and have the opportunity to come and talk to you all. And by the way, since we're residents of Gulfport, we too enjoy the Gulfport story. <laughs> <laughs> done research on the um, early baseball leagues 
that were located in Gulfport. Uh, so if you've never heard of the Gulfport tarpons or the Gulfport crabs, well, this meeting next month and he's, he's interested in getting more, more information. So we're, we're going to eat some.